Good day, everyone, and welcome to another uh, Animal Welfare Group Nigeria webinar series. And today we are happy to have Andrea Somese in our midst. I hope I did pronounce that properly. Perfectly, yes. <laughs> I am Ia Sere Oluwashonsera. I'm a senior lecturer at the Federal University of Agriculture, Abel Uta. I'll be the host for today and also the moderator of today's uh, presentation. We start, I would just like to talk a bit about what the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria stands for. The Animal Welfare Group Nigeria was established sometimes in December 2019 of researchers and students with an interest in animal behavior and welfare at the Federal University of Agriculture, Abel Kuta, Nigeria. And today we have 87 members from different institutions all over Nigeria. Is in three fold. We want to increase awareness in animal behavior and welfare in Nigeria. And secondly, to encourage research collaboration among Nigerian and international researchers especially in the field of animal behavior and welfare. And lastly, we are here to educate the public about the importance of animal welfare. Today, we'll be having the first presentation on dog, uh, apart from farm animals that we've been, you know, discussing over the years. Two weeks ago, we had Dr. Lisa Young in our midst, and she spoke about uh, the welfare of captive elephants. So today we have a presentation on dog. So I hope we find this interesting. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn at Animal Welfare Group Nigeria and on Twitter at AWGN14. We also have a YouTube channel where we upload all our webinars. So you can check it up and follow the previous webinars if you have missed them. <laughs> Andrea is, uh, is a postdoc at the E. LTE University of Budapest, uh, Department of Ethology. He has worked mostly with can canids on topics spanning ecology and behavior. His particular field of expertise is dog-human communication and dog's cognition. In the last two years, his research focused on language learning in dogs. Our word learning project, his word learning project, received considerable attention from the media, especially since it was the first live broadcast scientific event of its kind, the Genius Dog Challenge. The outcome of his research has been featured in many news reports across TV, the radio, newspapers, and other platforms. He has also, he has, he also has experience with studies on olfaction, ERP, neuroanatomy and the 3D modeling. Recently, he started collaborating with uh, Royal Canine on a project on learning and nutrition. It is, a, we have great pleasure to have you in our midst, Dr. Andres, and we're happy to listen to your presentation. Thank, oh, thank you for having me. So yes, I'm gonna talk to you, I'm gonna talk to you about dogs. And as any good story, this, story started a while ago. Actually, it's already been almost five years now. I wasn't yet in Budapest where I'm working now, but I, I've been told uh, the story from the very beginning. So I, I can also introduce you to this. But as I was saying, around five years ago, a person came to visit our department. The person in this picture here with the red t-shirt, his name is Helge. He's from Norway and he's a writer slash journalist. He came to our department because he was writing a book uh, on dogs and he wanted to ask some things to our um, head of the department, Professor Adam Mikloshi. He is very, very famous in the dog field. So he basically started dog science. So that's why Helge wanted to talk to him. Anyway, after the interview, Helge mentioned that he had a dog. Well, he has a dog still. Uh, the dog in the picture that you can see, Whiskey. And he also said something very interesting. He said that Whiskey knew the names of many, many of her toys. He claimed that Whiskey was able to recognize up to 50 or 60 of her toys by just the name. And here we have a very cute picture of her with some of those toys. You can see like a, a fish and a rabbit and a pork thing and yeah. But then we were like, okay, Helge is saying this thing and Sure, he thinks that Whiskey knows all these names, but how can we 
study this? How can we verify this? Because as you know, or as you probably know, owners always think that their dogs are special in some way. And of course they are, but one thing is to think something, one thing is to know and to prove it scientifically, of course. But actually at the time, my supervisor now, uh, Dr. Claudia Fugazza, she flew, she flew to Norway and she decided to test uh, whiskey's knowledge. So basically she had a very simple setup. You could see uh, here that basically whiskey was uh, between two rooms. In the first room, whiskey was with the owner. And in the second room, whiskey was able to see all the other toys. And this is very important for us that the toys and the owner will be in two different rooms because dogs are very good at picking up any kind of hints from humans. Even if you look at something or if you move like very, very slightly, dogs can immediately pick up the direction. And if they look at something and they look at you, then they kind of know like if they're doing good, you know? So it's very important that Whiskey would choose the, the toys independently. So one by one, Claudia and uh, Whiskey's owner, Helge, asked Whiskey to fetch her toys. And they found out that actually Whiskey knew 59 of her toys. So she could totally recognize and totally pick up immediately whichever toy Helge was asking for. So she got our seal of approval, let's say. <laughs> and about the, uh, sorry, around the same time, we also came in contact to another person who claimed to have one of these dogs knowing a lot of toys. This is Vicky Nina. Vicky Nina was uh, a dog from Brazil. Unfortunately, she passed uh, a few years ago. She was a bit sick, so she didn't have a, a good life in the end. But, the, but her owner loved her nevertheless. And yeah, as you can see here, she had a lot of toys and the owner was convinced that she could also recognize all the toys by their names. But then we started to have some questions because, okay, they know the names. We know that they can actually fetch these toys, but how can they learn these new words? How does that work for dogs? So there was a paper in 2004, so already uh, quite a long time ago, where they were saying that dogs can learn by exclusion. First of all, I have to say that this paper is, well, again, quite old at the moment. And also uh, there was only one dog in the study. So as you can imagine, it's a very short and a very little uh, experiment. But what do I mean when I say learning by exclusion? If I show you these three items here and I ask you which one is Toki, Maybe you don't know this word. I, I think it's like an Hungarian word or something like that that they use for the experiment. But you know for sure that on the left side, you have a watch and on the right side, you have an umbrella. So by exclusion, you can say, okay, maybe talk is this weird glass here uh, for one eye, basically. And you will be right if you guess that. So this is learning by exclusion. You know these two and then by exclusion, you say, okay, talky is the one in the middle. So we thought maybe dogs can do the same thing. Let's see if we can repeat the experiment they did 18 years ago. And that's what Claudia did when she went to Norway. I will show you now a brief video. The audio is not really important, but just to show you what happened. So we did an exclusion-based choice test. So for the test, as you can read also, uh, Helge was asking Whiskey to bring back a known toy. You can see here that she had quite a, quite a selection. You can also see how nicely she goes directly to that toy. She doesn't play with the others. She doesn't care about the others, but she's very task oriented. Then Helge asks again for another non toy. And this is kind of to warm up the dog so that they know what they're doing and they're entering the mindset that, okay, now we are working. Now I'm just fetching the toy. I'm not spending too much time playing with it. It's more about, again, working. But you can see that, of course, Whiskey is enjoying. The, the toy anyway. <laughs> but again, the, the very nice thing, at least for me, is that she was going directly for this specific one. She didn't even touch or look at the others. And then she comes back. So now Helge will ask for a new one. He will ask for Dolphin. You can see that Whiskey is really listening. She's just there sitting and listening to the owner. And you can clearly see dolphin on the floor. It's of course this one. And then Whiskey is able to recognize dolphin even if she never heard that word. So now she's gonna play for a while with it. 
I am still not really sure why. I think she kind of needs to feel it or maybe it's just a new toy and she's just happy to have a new toy to play with. I really wish I could just talk to them and know what they're thinking, but we are trying to get there. So at least we have always like with our, with every experiment, we have a better and a better idea what they're thinking about. But yeah, you can see that also the owner and Claudia were waiting for it. They didn't really know what was happening because as I was saying, the dog is in another room, so they don't have any uh, access to it. They couldn't see what we're seeing now on the camera. So they didn't know that Whiskey was just playing with Dolphin and she was just having plenty of fun, just chewing the toy and dragging it around. <clears throat> But yeah, eventually she decides, okay, now it's time to go back. Now I can bring Dolphin back. And both her owner and Claudia were very surprised to see that actually she could pick up one toy just because she excluded the word out of the others. But then we wanted to see, okay, dogs can kind of uh, do this kind of learning by exclusion. At least we have some hints of that. But can they actually learn the words? So does uh, Whiskey know now that Dolphin is that specific toy? So before I was asking you which one was Toki, and you guessed correctly, it, it was the one in the middle. If I ask you now which one is Lico, you probably do the same thing. You know that this is an apple, you know that this is a broomstick. So Sleeko must be this weird glass here for two people. But actually, when we tested the dogs, so when we tested both Whiskey and Bikinina, we realized that they were not so sure about the names. So those names that they learned only uh, by exclusion, they were not so reliable. So they were like, Whiskey was 40% correct uh, during the trials and Vicky was a bit better, but still not as good as uh, it should be. So they were basic, basically uh, around uh, chance level. So we realized that, okay, dogs, at least these two dogs cannot learn uh, via exclusion. It seems that they can pick up an item uh, via exclusion, but when they have two toys and these words were taught in this way, it doesn't really work. But how do they learn the words then? We asked the owners and we wanted to see how they were teaching their dogs. And they were just saying, both of them, they were saying that they just play with the toys. So they just mention the name of the toy and they keep playing with it. They just do fetching or tug of war or anything really. So we tried, okay, what happens if we try to actually teach the names of the toys with a playful social interaction? And here the results were quite different. As you can see here, we had Whiskey, Vicky, and also typical dog, typical family, dog, family dogs that were not experienced in this kind of experiment. And you can see that both Whiskey and Vicky Nina, when they were learning through a uh, social experience, they were very reliable, almost at 80, uh, 75%. Instead, as I was saying before, when they were learning through exclusion, they were not so reliable and they were around chance level, which is 50%, of course, because the, the selection was between two toys. And the other interesting thing you can see here is that also family dogs that were not experienced with this kind of uh, setup were not so good at it. So for now, we learned that gifted dogs can learn words quickly. It only needs four exposures, so four times that the owner is playing with them. They can learn through a social context, pretty much like children learn new words. But the other thing is that their memory decays rapidly. So after around 10 minutes, they were starting to be very, very bad and they were starting forgetting these new names. But then we thought, okay, Whiskey and Nikki Nina can do this, but can all the other dogs do it? So for this, we recruited a bunch of other dogs. So we had six gifted world learning dogs. Those gifted dogs were all those that the owners reported to um, Basically the owners supported their dogs to know the names of the words, just like Helge did the very first time. And again, we tested if they actually knew and they were reliable. The interesting thing is that the, we had six of them and they were all border collies, which is something that will come in place also later. And then we recruited typical dogs. 
So we had 16 plus one border collies. This one is not included, and I will explain you why in a little bit. And then we also had 16 dogs of other breeds. And the age of this dog, these dogs was going from puppyhood to adulthood, because we also wanted to see if adult dogs were a bit worse than puppies when it comes to this, because we thought that maybe puppies would be more uh, elastic and that their brain would be more flexible and more eager to learn new words. So for the experiment, we had a very simple setup. The owner was asked to play with two toys and learn and teach the dogs the, the names of those two toys over the span of three months. So every single week, they were actually meeting with the trainer, with a certified trainer, and we were kind of observing what they were doing with the dogs to see if they needed any suggestion or if they needed any feedback. But basically they were playing consistently with these dogs every single day of the week and every single day of the month. And each month we had a test where we were, where we were, were uh, verifying if the dogs was learning or not. The test is pretty much uh, very simple. Again, you have the toy, the two toys in one room and then the dog and the owner in another. So again, we want to avoid that the owner looks at the, the toys or at the dog or anything really. And these were our results. You can see here in red on the bottom, these are the typical dogs and they were never able to fetch the correct toy. They were always around chance level. They kind of developed a bias level, uh, sorry, um, a side bias. So they were always going either for the left or the right because it was more convenient. And of course they were right 50% of the time. So why not? Otherwise they were also uh, developing a preference for a specific toy over the other. So again, they were always correct at 50%. So not so good. But instead here, you can see that the six gifted dogs were very, basically pretty much almost 100% correct all the time. Here, there is a little bit of uh, a lower number because one of the dogs actually passed uh, during the, the, um, the experiment. I mean, not during the experiment, during those three months because she was sick and unfortunately we lost her. But yeah, that's, that, that's the, the only reason is that here we have five dogs instead of, uh, sorry, six dogs instead of seven. So here you can see a little bit better uh, the results. So we wanted to see how many, uh, how many toys these dogs will learn over the course of the three months. And you can see that here, the typical naive dogs didn't learn any toy, as I was saying before. This is Oliva. Oliva is the one that actually passed uh, when, uh, we were, uh, when we were uh, training her. And Oliva is, was actually recruited as a typical dog. She's the plus one that I was mentioning before, the 16 plus one, this is Oliva. She's also border. She was also border collie, and she actually learned ten toys during the first month and eleven toys during the second. And then also the other uh, six gifted dogs learn between six and ten uh, toys per month. So not only they learn those two toys that they were supposed to learn for the experiment, they also learn some extra because they just like doing so. So now we know that most dogs struggle with learning even just two objects. It seems that it's a very difficult task and either dogs can do it or they cannot do it. It seems that gifted dogs have this very rare ability and they can learn multiple names of toys. So once they start, they can learn 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 of toys. And the other thing that we uh, propose is that gifted dogs can be used as a model to study talent. Dogs have already been used as a model for many, many things. Some of these I'm also gonna mention uh, later in this presentation. So it's very easy actually to study dogs. You don't need any kind of special equipment or anything. You just need a camera and a room. You can also do tests at home with the owners. Usually people are very keen on doing that and you don't have any problem related to uh, housing the dogs or anything like that. Because as I was mentioning, the dogs are just volunteering. So we have people coming to the department, they do their tests, we play with their dogs and they just have fun and that's pretty much it. And the other thing is that this is, as I was saying, a rare ability in dogs. So it seems to follow the same mechanism that is, that is, that is in place for talent in humans. I'm sure you know that some people are very talented when it comes to music or when it comes to art or anything really. And it seems that the same thing is going on for dogs. 
So these gifted dogs are very talented and are very specific and they can learn the names of many words, but they're not special in any other way. They cannot do any other things differently from the other dogs, just this very unique thing. So as again, I will, we, as always, we have more and more questions, of course, because we also wanted to know how fast and for how long these dogs could learn. Because first we realized, okay, they can learn very fast, but their memory is not that great. So let's see how this process works a bit better. So we knew, as I was saying, that the, these dogs, the gifted dogs, learn the, name, the names of new toys after a few exposures. I, I was mentioning even just four times playing with the toy is enough. But if you do so, then their memory declines rapidly. So after 10 minutes, they're already not so good and they don't remember so well. It seems though that when it comes to commands, the, if you train your dog for many, many sessions, but very short sessions, these are not so efficient. This is actually kind of controversial at the moment because again, this paper is from almost uh, 12 years ago and training is a very, very hot topic when it comes to dog science. Now there is more research showing that maybe actually short training is a bit better um, rather than having a very long session over the day. But the results are very mixed and very inconclusive. So I, I cannot tell you anything for sure. Also, because as you can imagine, training is a huge industry. So there is a lot of interest when it comes to that. So it's a bit hard to do research because you don't really want to push the wrong buttons. Anyway, we wanted to see again how, uh, how fast and for how long the dogs can learn. So we decided to launch this project. We had this uh, live event on YouTube and all our social media. So last, no, two years actually, it's, it's already been two years. Uh, during winter, we launched the Genius Dog Challenge. The Genius Dog Challenge had actually two uh, aims. One was to find out the answer to the scientific question, but we also wanted to find out, find out more dogs. Because the surprising thing here is that even when we were looking actively for dogs that are able to learn the name to learn the names of many toys, we only found seven. And you can imagine that there are millions of dogs all over the world, but we found seven dogs, which is a very small number. So we wanted to launch this very big project. It was broadcasted, as I was saying, on all our social media and YouTube. It was followed by thousands of people. It was all over the media, any kind of media, you name it, newspaper, radios, or whatever. And now I can show you a little bit of a, a trailer of what uh, was the Genius Dog Project, the Genius Dog Challenge, sorry. So this is Max. He's a gifted dog from uh, Hungary. The only one we have here, actually. So here you can see other of our dogs. I'm gonna show you all of them in a bit so you can see them properly. <clears throat> so this was pretty much the trailer we we had made for this project. It was super challenging actually. I, I never filmed anything. This was my very first time. And even if I have a very short line, it's like five words. I had to do it so many times because it was very, very challenging to just be in front of a camera and act normal. I, I don't look normal at all, but anyway, the, the trailer is, is out, was out and it, it's still on YouTube if you want to look at it again, if you, you couldn't see the pictures well or you couldn't hear well, but yeah, pretty much this was the, our base to find, uh, to first of all, um, show the, the science we were doing and also to find other dogs. Oh. 
But for the genus dog challenge, we had two stages. So during the first stage, the, those six dogs, they were supposed to learn six toys in one week. So pretty much one toy every day. And then for the second stage, the difficult went way higher because they were supposed to learn 12 toys in a one week. So pre pretty much twice as difficult. The owners were super, super nice with us. They were super reliable. They were super professional. They acted like scientists and they did everything they could to help us. So <clears throat> every single day, they made sure to play with their dogs at least for around 30 minutes. And as I was saying, the play session is very, very simple. It's very natural. So the owner is just playing with the toy and saying the dog's, uh, the, the toy's name. I will show you here uh, a clip from that. Here you see Gaia. She's a, a gifted dog from Brazil. Here you will see her playing with her owner. As I was saying, it was winter, so you can also see a Christmas tree in the background. But yeah, the, the owner is just throwing the toy, just fetching it, just taking it and saying the name a couple of times and it seems to be enough. Oh. So for the test, we had again, our usual setup. So this is how during the Genius Dog Challenge it looked for the people who are watching. Again, you can also watch it again on YouTube if you want. Here we have Helge with whiskey and here we have the camera on the toys. So we had 12 toys, uh, actually more, 15 toys on the floor. Helge was asking for one of those that Whiskey learned during that week. You will see, yeah. Again, you can see very professional. Helge had the uh, earphones, so a Whiskey could only hear his voice. She couldn't be distracted by anything else. And Whiskey, whiskey just goes, search for it, and then she fetches the correct one. Very, very effectively. And as I was saying, they had uh, six weeks to learn six, to uh, sorry, one week to learn six toys and one week to learn 12 toys. After one week, then we put all the, we asked the owners to put all the toys away. So they just put everything in a box and they didn't play with these toys for uh, a month. And also for with some of them also for two months. Then after this time was, passed, we asked the owners to take some of the toys out of the box. And then we tested if dogs were able to remember these toys again after one month or after two months. And you can see here the results. So experiment number one is the first stage of the Genius Dog Challenge. So when the dogs were supposed to learn, sorry, <clears throat> uh, six toys in one week, and you can see that they were super, super good. Same thing that when they were learning 12 toys in one week. Experiment number three is after a month. So you can see that the dogs were a bit worse, but they were still kind of pretty good actually. And the same thing after two months. Here, the chance level was very low. It's not even uh, written here because we had again, 15 toys on the floor and they had to pick one specific one. So it was one out of 15 every single time. So even if the result is around 60% is clearly above chance level because chance level is around 5% when it comes to this. So just to summarize it a bit, so during the first stage of the Genius Dog Challenge, four dogs were able to learn six toys and two dogs were able to learn five toys. It's kind of reversed when it comes to the second stage, two dogs were learning all the toys, so 12 toys and four dogs were learning only, uh, only <laughs> 11. Then after five months, uh, sorry, after one month, uh, five dogs remember all six of their toys. Only one dog was at chance level. And then even after two months, three dogs remember all toys, two dogs remember six toys, uh, five toys, sorry. And only one dog was kind of bad, but still good with three of, uh, of the toys. So just to summarize the, the results from this, uh, the dogs were able to learn six and 12 new toys in one week. So they have pretty much the same learning rate or a learning rate that it's comparable to a, a baby that it's 18 months old. The learning rate is also comparable to, the, to that uh, of previous studies. But in this study here that I'm mentioning, this Piley and Reed, they had to train the dogs uh, for, well, they had actually one dog also in that paper. And they had to train that dog for hours and hours every day. 
Here, the playful interaction was not more than 30 minutes per day, so way less training. And then again, the learning uh, during social interaction seems to be very uh, clear and it seems to be comparable to ostensible labeling in infants. And the memory retention in this case is not 10 minutes anymore, but it's up to two months. So very, very reliable and very strong uh, memory retention. Here you can see a picture of Max uh, with uh, <clears throat> the medal that we gave to all the participants of the gifted dog, uh, the genius dog challenge. So just to uh, mention one more thing that we were researching on, because during all these experiments, we were observing these dogs and we were getting to know these dogs. You know, it's always the same six subjects. So we kind of know them pretty well right now. And even if I actually didn't meet most of them because only one of them is in Hungary, but the other five are in Brazil, Norway, um, the Netherlands, um, Spain, and the last one is, ah, the last one I can't remember at the moment, but I will tell you in a second. Anyway, we were observing these dogs and we found that there was something a bit odd going on. There was something surprising. So we went kind of uh, on a treasure hunt here because we noticed that when we were, when the owner was talking to their dogs, they were doing this thing. They were tilting their head. And we wanted to know why they're doing this because dogs do it actually somewhat often, but we don't really know how this mechanism work. So just to introduce you to the topic, we researched this behavior. So we researched side preference and we, know, we uh, found out that there is actually a preference in most vertebrates and mostly mammals, I would say, in processing sensory information. So uh, research from uh, 25, more than 25 years ago found out that in chicks, you have this kind of preference in eye use and they tend to turn their head to use one eye over the other when they're looking to a specific stimulus. The same thing happens in also other vertebrates as I was mentioning. So also frogs tend to use one eye over the other when it comes to looking at specific stimulus. There is also very, somewhat funny experiment where they were putting a hat on the head of the frogs and they, and they were just recording which paw the, the frog was using to, to take off the, the hat. So they could also see this kind again of side preference. Horses tend also to use one eye over the other when they're looking at something. Sea lions tend to listen to, to con specific calls with one ear over the other. Magbees also tend to use one, uh, one eye over the other. And of course, also humans and dogs do the same thing. So we know from previous research, also uh, done here in Hungary, that brain the dog's brain is lateralized. So there is a right hemisphere and left hemisphere, just like in humans. And they have different uh, tasks. They take over different tasks, of course. So for instance, we know that when you uh, say something that it's meaningless to the dog, so some made up words or something that they don't really know, they process this information with the left side. So they tend to look at you with, and they listen to you with the right side of their face. So with the right, uh, right eye and right ear, because dogs also have this uh, crossed uh, inversion in the brain. So when they're hearing something with the left ear, they're actually processing with the left uh, side of the brain. The other way around, when they listen to something that's familiar, like a command, like when you ask your dog to sit or to fetch something or to lay, uh, lay down, or when you say something nice to them, when you call them a good boy or a good girl, they process this information with the right side of the brain. So again, they listen to this thing with the left ear. So you can see that they actually move the left ear, but they process it with the right side because of the inversion. There are also other uh, lateralized behavior in dogs that are very, very clear and very evident. Dogs tend to uh, look at stimulus with one eye over the other, according to the, the, the kind of uh, simulation that they have. If it's something scary, if it's, some, if it's a conspecific and so on. They also tend to sniff at something with different, with using one nostril over the other. Of course, one behavior that it's very, very visible is the walking and the angle uh, the tail assumes during the walking, my, my, uh, it can be different according to the response the dog is having in that moment, if they're more aggressive or if they're more friendly. And of course, there are also studies uh, showing a paw preference. 
these studies are a bit more confusing because in this specific study, they had four experiments in which they were asking dogs to do things from like fetching something from under the couch or stepping down a ladder, things like this. And they found out that dogs have a different preference according to the task. So for instance, if the dog was fetching something from under the couch with the right, with the right paw, maybe they prefer to walk down, down the ladder first with the left. So it's very inconsistent. It was also very inconsistent over the, the time period they did these experiments. So it's a bit more tricky when it comes to this. Anyway, let's go back to the head tilt because that's also a lateralized behavior. It could be done, of course, on the uh, towards the right or the left. So we did some research and we found out that there was, there was no scientific proof of this behavior. There are some rumors saying that maybe they do it because they want to look better at something, or maybe there is an ecological reason behind it. Maybe it's an adaptive mechanism, but we don't really know. The only thing that we knew was that it, it might be a medical condition. So if your dog is chronically having the, deck, the, the, the head tilted on one side, they might have a neurological problem. But again, it's not an instance. It's something that the dog does all the time because they can actually not move uh, the head anyhow. And then we, we heard that there was something about hearing, but there was no paper or no research done until we did. So that's the, the paper I'm mentioning now. So let's go through the, the speculation that we heard about. And again, there is no research whatsoever. So everything you're gonna hear now is just things that the owner reported or people say, and if you Google, you will find a lot of these things on the internet. So when it comes to sight, the idea is that dolicocephalic dogs, so those dogs that have a very long nose, don't see so very well. And they tend to tilt their heads because they need to see better. A very easy way to test this also on yourself is if you put the fist in front of your face, you will have, of course, your own fist impairing your vision. But if you tilt the head, you can kind of see better and focus better on a specific point. So as I was saying, there is no scientific proof. And even if it seems that brachycephalic dogs, so those that have a short muzzle, tilt their head more often, which makes no sense because then it will be against the original hypothesis here. Because actually these dogs don't have anything impairing their view. The other idea is the ecological reason, because we know that foxes and wolves, well, we think so, because there is also no research, uh, no research on foxes and wolves that they tilt their head to identify something, a prey or something like that um, under the snow. Here you can see the fox tilting the head and then she goes for the jump when, when, when she finds the, or at least she thinks she found the prey. So there might be something here. Again, no research whatsoever. If you work with wild animals, feel free to, to, to reach out. I would love to do something when it comes to this. And then, sorry. So here, the, there is the adaptive uh, hypothesis. So dogs do it just because it's cute. So I, I stopped the audio just because uh, here you have Helge talking to Whiskey, so the Norwegian dog. And of course, he's speaking Norwegian and he's just saying whatever. And Whiskey tilts the head very often. And maybe they do it because we, are, we perceive this behavior as very cute. So we praise them and we give them treats and all that. But again, no research whatsoever when it comes to this. So here you saw another of our gifted dogs. This is actually a new one. She's Lexi from the US. Here the owner, I don't know if you could hear it, but the owner was asking, where is Jose? And it's this specific toy here. And when the owner was saying that specific sentence, so where is this? Lexi was tilting their head, was tilting her head. And we noticed that all the gifted dogs were doing, were doing that when the owner was asking for a specific toy. Here you can see again the experiment uh, we did where the owner was in one room and the toys were in another. Here we have Max, he's Hungarian. So the owner is gonna speak Hungarian, that's why I have the subtitles, but she's just gonna ask, where is Sebastian? Where is Sebastian? And here you saw a very nice tilt. I will play it again because it's just a short video. <clears throat> Sebastian. 
So you see that Max is really focused on the owner. He's just looking at the owner. Then he hears the word, tilt the head, thinks about it, and then goes for the toy. And I assure you that he got Sebastian right. So for this, we basically had the same sample as before. So we had those six gifted border collies. Then we had the 16 typical one plus Oliva, at least for two months we had her. And then we, all, we had all the other dogs. The situation was again the same. We had the, the dogs trained for, it was the same experiment. We just looked at it in a different way. Basically, yeah, I was just sitting at home uh, on my desk or on my couch, and I was just watching the recording of uh, the previous experiments we did. And uh, the recordings was pretty much like this. So here you have a typical dog. This is Moki, if I remember well. And here the owner will ask again in Hungarian, so we, you don't need the audio. And she will ask for the, the toy. You can see that Moki is there, kind of listening, then she goes. And this is Gaia, the uh, gifted dog from Brazil. And again, the owner is going to speak Portuguese. So she's going to ask for a specific toy. And here you will see a very nice tilt. So Gaia hears the name, tilt the head, and then goes. So pretty much was I was, what I was doing was to record how many tilts I, I was able to see. Here I saw zero, here I saw one. And I was also recording to which, towards which side the dog was tilting the head. And we found out, first of all, that typical dogs almost never tilted their head when it comes to this specific contest, context. So when the owner is asking for a toy, while the gifted dogs were doing that pretty much every other trial, so around 60% of the time. The other super interesting thing is that dogs were always tilting the head towards the same side. So Gaia was mostly doing it towards the left, same as Oliva, Enrico, and Whiskey, while Max and Alani were mostly, basically always doing it towards the right. <clears throat> Just to show you uh, all our dogs here, Gaia is the one from Brazil, and she was tilting the head towards the left, just as much as Whiskey, the gifted dog from uh, Norway. Then, as I was saying, Max and uh, the gifted dog from Hungary and Nalani, the one from the Netherlands, are tilting the heads toward uh, the head towards the right. Then we had the one gifted dog from the US, Squall, and he was never tilting his head. No idea why. And then Oliva and Rico were actually doing it mostly on the on the left, but also sometimes on the right. So as you can see here, there is no clear pattern. We have dogs of both. Uh, sex is doing it we are we are not sure why they prefer one side over the other but they were just very consistent or even we have one of these dogs never doing it so it seems that dogs kind of think about what they're hearing when they hear the name of the toy so there might be some sort of cross model match going on in dogs memory so they hear the name of the toy in their mind they match the mental image of the toy they have and then they go and fetch it Another thing that was very important for us was to record the position of the owner. Because at this point, you might say, okay, maybe the tilt was towards the left because the owner was sitting at the, uh, uh, on the left of the dog. So, of course, they were listening with that side. But actually, it had no influence. Even if the owner was on the right or the left or in the middle, the tilt was always consistent and always on the same side. And the other thing, it was also consistent to, uh, around all these three months. So dogs never changed the side. So I mentioned so far just six, well, mostly six dogs plus Oliva. And I just wanted to add that luckily we don't have only six dogs at the moment. We almost have 30. The other thing that I want to mention is that most of them are border collies, sure, but they're not just border collies. Our group is growing. Now we have some German Shepherds. We have a Corgi that joined us recently. We have a Poodle. We have a Labradoodle. So it seems that it's um, th there is something related to the genetics of these dogs, but we don't know yet for sure. Of course, we have more Border Collies, but I just want to do, make sure that you understand that it's not just Border Collies. If you want to know more about our research here, I basically summarized four of our papers. They're all uh, open access, so you can find them easily. If you cannot, just contact me, and, and I'm very happy to send you over whatever you need. And yeah, for any uh, further information, you can reach me out at my email. 
You can also reach out uh, on our YouTube channel where we publish the, the, the videos of these dogs and also the visual abstracts for our papers. We also have a, an Instagram account, a Facebook page and a, a web page. Very important and a thing that I always mention, if you know any of these dogs, if your friends or you or anyone has a dog that knows the, the names of many toys, please, please, please reach out because we're always happy to have one more. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. <laughs> oh, that's, it's mind blowing to learn about <laughs> dogs learning different names of toys and to learn maybe six or 12 toys in a week. Oh, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Andrea, for the wonderful <laughs> presentation. And uh, we have loads of questions for you in the chat box. I hope you will have time to address each and every one of them. I also want to appreciate the participants for making this interactive by dropping their questions in the chat box. So I would like to start by taking the first question. Does dog breed have effects on their learning and memory? So we don't know. As I was saying, we have mostly border collies, so there might be something, but we are still running our genetics experiment. We are having a lot of trouble when it comes to uh, getting back DNA samples from the owners, because as I was mentioning, most of the dogs are all over the world. So we have to wait for uh, the shipment, <laughs> most of all, which is very sad and a very stupid reason to delay our science, but that's how it is. Well, thank you so much. Uh, when you show the map uh, mm -hmm. of the quest for uh, the general dog, I noticed, like you mentioned, from the different countries where you got the dog, were the dogs sent to you and you did the, you subjected them to the trial, or did they come with their owners, or how did it work? Oh, actually, we test them online, so we just oh. them on Zoom. <laughs> 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 it was. It was something that started along the, the pandemic, to be to be fair. So first of all, it was impossible to travel for that reason. And second of all, as you can imagine, it would be very expensive for us to go there and do the test. So we found out pretty much immediately we could just use a camera, like a web uh, camera like this. We could just connect on Zoom and have one laptop in the in the room with the owner and one laptop or one phone in the room with the, with the toys. And that's it. So it's... Wow. Very easy, very economic, convenient. <laughs> the virtual training process, that is amazing. So did you consider the sex of the dogs during the experiment? Yes, and there was no effect of the sex. Oh, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, do you think the learning environment of dogs can influence the rate of learning or their cognitive experience? Mm -hmm. So the only thing that we found out to be different in these dogs is that they really enjoy playing. We actually published a new paper like a week ago or something. And the only difference between these dogs and the typical ones seems to be that they enjoy playing more than anything else. So even over food, they are very, very toy motivated. I, again, I, I'm not really sure why and I cannot answer to that, but it seems to be the only different. And the owner, are prim they come from different backgrounds. They are... Uh, different social background, different economical backgrounds. The only thing in common that they have is that they play with their dogs. Oh. <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> so they, they prefer play over food. Yes. So play to them is more rewarding than food. Yes, exactly. Oh, yes. Amazing. So do you think the learning, okay, I'm taking that. Do dogs have preference for a particular trainer? Um, no, not specifically. The We had two trainers working on this project. We have still two trainers working on this project. They don't really develop, they didn't really develop any sort of preference. They just really like us, at least the ones that we met in person, because they know that when they see us, they're going to play. So, <laughs> so uh, this training, like you said, it was done virtually. And uh, where do you think... The, the dogs were anticipating another training session? That I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think they were picking up, you know, when the owner was setting up the cameras and all of that. So they were getting excited for it. Sometimes we need to have uh, like a five, 10 minutes period when we connect to the owner because they need to kind of relax because the dogs are so excited and they just want to play. So you can literally see the dogs just panting and being super happy. 
So th there is, of course, a little bit of anticipation, but the, the training was never at the same time because we rely mostly on the availability of the owners, as you can imagine. So we, we, we were doing it whenever. Yeah, that's good. So actually, you can <clears throat> talk about maybe the time of the day effect and things like that. You, you have that, that is a bit hard for us to, yeah, to establish because the owners play with the, the dogs whenever they can. If they have a busy week, we cannot ask them to to do anything really. Okay. They, they already do so much for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, did you check what, uh, do you have an idea about the physiological states of the dogs? Whether physiological states of dogs affect their learning? Or let me ask the second mm -hmm. part of it, uh, maybe their emotional state. How does it both physiological and emotional state? How does it affect their learning? So we don't have results from that side either. We are waiting for again some uh, something more physiologically connected. Uh, we just know that the dogs were, as I was saying, very excited to do the task. You you could see from just the behavior. We didn't do any measurement when it comes to this. But they were just overly uh, excited, overly happy to to, per to participate, basically, and to do the experiment. Yeah. From, my, from my experience in training chickens, mm -hmm. uh, there are times we use uh, a reward and uh, something that is unpalatable, which at times we call it punishment, so that they'll be able to differentiate the location or the position where we're training them to do something. So for these dogs, where they uh, subjected to any any form of uh, punishment in court uh, if they did or if they picked the wrong toy what what was what happened mm -hmm. so there was no punishment and the only thing is that the dog doesn't play with the toy so if they bring the or the so when they bring the correct one the owner is rewarding them just doing tug of war or something if they bring the the the, the, the bad one the wrong one the, the 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 owner picks up the toy and just put it in a basket and that's it there is no so, playing or no, no praise or anything. Yeah, but how does the dog take that kind of thing? How how do they how can can you really paint the picture how of how they felt not being mm -hmm. rewarded or not being praised? So when they actually they are not so uh, not so often wrong. So there is that. <laughs> but when they are wrong and they 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 bring the toy and the owner doesn't play with them, they're just they just wait. So they wait and most of the time they just sit and wait for the next uh, task. I think they understand that they're wrong and they actually, uh, with most of the experiments, they have a second choice. So they can go again and search for the toy. And usually during the second choice, they're correct. And then they get to play. Oh, oh so interesting. I have here uh, <clears throat> those using uh, a preferred eye position. Is it related to their personality? Maybe they put it is bold, or does it say the animal is shy? And uh, would that uh, matter? Any studies or suggestions for animal play? Does the use of the eye or the head position, does it say something about the personality of the dog? I think there is research on that. Uh, one of the people that I know the, the, that has studied the, the lateralization the most is the, the person I was mentioning also in the slides, Giorgio Vallortigara is another Italian uh, researcher. I think he did something like that. I'm not quite sure, but if you're interested, I would probably search first for him and his research. Okay, uh, that was interesting. Uh... Do you think the number of animals was enough for a statistical analysis? You use like yes. seven? So yes, that, there was an issue at first because we didn't have many dogs. Uh, the important thing here is that in all the other papers before with these gifted dogs, they only had one. So reaching a sample size of six was already incredible. And the second thing is that, yes, we actually had enough statistical power because we had so many toys on the floor. As I was mentioning during the talk, we had uh, 15 toys on the floor or 20 toys on the floor. So it was one out of 20, which gave us enough to be uh, to establish a certain chance level and to have a certain uh, a statistical power. Now we are lucky because we have almost 30 gifted dogs. But that's why at the end I was saying that if you know anyone, please let us know because the more the merrier, of course. <laughs> Oh, 
that's amazing good to learn about talk behavior uh, i've exhausted the questions in the chat box so i have my own personal questions i have uh, like two uh the uh, whiskey if i'm mm -hmm. if i'm correct was the one that got the medal mm -hmm. uh what, what what was it like for the dog when it got the medal <laughs> Oh, the, the dog was happy, but I feel they, they were the dogs were mostly happy about the toys, and the owner was the owners were very proud with the medals. They also got a certificate. I, I showed the last slide very quickly, yeah. Yeah. but all the gifted dogs get a certificate from us, and it's signed by me and my colleagues and the university. It's kind of like an official diploma. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the last question from me was that um, you are also interested in uh, language learning. The mm -hmm. dog language learning now, and uh, for me, I think uh, in humans, children tend to learn faster in new language or something than an adult. Yeah, and the, is it the same for the dogs? Do you think uh, the younger ones learn faster than the adult ones? Or so we tried with puppies, and they didn't learn any names, but those were typical puppies. Ideally, we would like to have gifted puppies to see if they are actually learning even faster than their parents. But we are a bit unlucky when it comes to that because most of our dogs are neutered. So we cannot really have gifted puppies at the moment. We might be able to find one by chance. But again, as I was saying, at the very beginning, we found six dogs out of millions. And now we have 25 out of millions. So when you talk about gifted uh, puppies, do you mean this? You, did you give them the name gifted based on their performance in the test or mm -hmm. how did it come about that name? Yes, yes. The name was given because of how well they learned the names of toys. And again, it's something related just to these specific things. Thing. We, we tested the dogs also for other uh, for other tasks like inhibition tasks or uh, quantity discrimination or neophobia and, and so on, um, neophilia. And we found out that the, there is no difference whatsoever. These are just normal dogs, but somehow they learn many, many names of their toys. Okay. It's the only difference. Yeah, at this point, I also want to appreciate all the participants. Please feel free to turn on your video. And if you have further comments for the presenter, kindly indicate by raising your hand and uh, I will unmute you and keep your comment. Uh, any comment from the participant? It was really great having you on this platform, Andrea. And uh, this you. has made me you know, try to begin to have uh, a kind of love for dogs. And that was a very nice presentation. Uh, you know, on Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, we are used to hearing uh, things about uh, livestock species, mm -hmm. but the last two presentations are so educative and informative. Uh, the last presentation was on elephants, and it, I learned a lot of new things. And today I learned about gifted dogs, and those dogs are so wonderful. Yeah, and to they're incredible. They yeah. more intelligent than human beings. I don't know why. And there are, are just few of them. Uh, so, Andrew, thank you for the work you are doing. It's, <laughs> it's one in a million because many people are interested in uh, livestock cognition, but you are working on dogs. So, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a welcome. pleasure. <laughs> yeah. I asked this uh, question, Andrea. What is the name of your group? Is it the farm dog project? So we are a small section of the family dog project. Uh, uh, the name is Gifted World Learning Project, Gifted Dogs Project. We don't have an official name, so <laughs> it's just like three of us. <laughs> we, are, we are a very small group. Yeah, but are you also part of the many dog project? Yeah, we are planning to. Actually, we, we are planning to be part of that because we would love to, to do something like that. So. We are starting to to collect uh, data also, so we can participate. Because I I love this idea of the the many species. I, I saw that they're doing it also for goats, and it's yeah, the incredible. Many goals, yeah. The many goats and the many birds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
it's a great idea and I, I and that's what i like about science the possibility that we can connect to each other and we can collaborate with each other i don't like the, the old-fashioned idea to do science you know just in your lab and just with your own group and never meeting new people it's it's pointless it's not science and now that we have all these tools like zoom or anything like online we can just meet amazing people and work together so once again thank you so much for your presentation on our group we really appreciate your time and we love what you're doing and hopefully you'll be able to get some um uh no dog owners from Africa or from Nigeria who are interested in in this kind of work and may at least be part of uh, be part of your project and uh, with that I would like to say thank you to all the participants uh, Dr. Ojela de Novelota Pisa is always joining our program from Brazil thank you so much Valentine Azade Jalali he actually joined Azade I appreciate you because you joined about uh, if not 20 minutes to the begin to the start of the pro uh, program. Thank you so much for staying through to the end. And Saeed, you've been wonderful. You've always joined our program. Victor, thank you. Miriam Nogulek, I appreciate you. And thanks for the thumbs up. And Zara and uh, Amini Faj. Jatutu, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. And I want to believe we've all learned one or two things from today's presentation. Uh, more, many love or more love to the dogs in the world. And for those of you that have dogs already, uh, the level of intelligence is so high. And like uh, Andrea said, it's comparable to 18 month old child or something. So uh, it, it's time for you to, to make use of that opportunity of their intelligence and make them do a few things. You just <laughs> set them on errands and they will help you. Thank you so much. With that, I'll say have a lovely day to everybody and see you in, as that will be in a month's time. We are not likely going to have the meeting in two weeks time because of the ISA uh, Global Conference in September. So the next meeting we'll be having will be in a month's time. And please don't forget to follow us on Facebook, on LinkedIn at uh, uh, Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, and on Twitter at AWGN14. And also, if you have missed any of our webinar presentations, you can uh, check them up on the uh, YouTube on our YouTube channel. And they are there for us to be to, to learn. It's like an educational resource uh, point where you can just listen and pick a few things. So thank you so much and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>